Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us here in the Blue Room. Um, coming over after lunch, we're going to have a discussion around trends in the gaming industry. Um, I'm Gregory Milken, uh, managing partner at March Capital, focused on the gaming space. Um, and we focus really much on series uh, seed and series A for game investments and focus on content and tech around the gaming space. Uh, I'm going to moderate a discussion here with our three panelists, just asking them some questions about you know, what they see is happening in the gaming industry. Um, so I think we'd be best if you all just give maybe a minute introduction of who you are and you know, where you sit relevant to the gaming industry. Absolutely. Hello. Um, I'm Hope Cochran, and I'm currently an investor with Madrona Venture Group up in Seattle. I'm doing a lot of like elbow bumping these days. <laughs> Um, but prior to uh, being a partner at Madrona, I was the CFO of King Digital. Um, King Digital makes the Candy Crush family of games and several other mobile casual gaming. I joined them as their CFO um, right when they were just about to go public. So Candy Crush had just come on the scene and um, it, it surprised everyone with its success. And so we took them public and then ultimately Activision bought the, the company. Hey, I'm <clears throat> John Robinson, president for 100 Thieves. Uh, we describe ourselves as a gaming lifestyle brand, so similar to maybe uh, Supreme or something like that. So we have esports teams, but we also really focus on the apparel brand that we built, as well as entertainment that we put out. Um, and before this, I was a games investor at Bessemer Venture Partners, and before that, spent a lot of time on the publishing side, working for Electronic Arts and uh, Nexon. I'm Ari Siegel. I'm the CEO of Immortals Gaming Club. So much like John and 100 Thieves, we operate esports teams, but also do a lot of other stuff too. But unlike building a lifestyle and apparel brand, uh, which they've done, I'd say they're best in class at that, we focus more on delivering a platform and related services to gamers, so not necessarily esports athletes or professionals, but actual players of the games, um, mostly in Latin America. Uh, and then we're also involved in gaming related ventures. Before that, I worked in traditional sports. Uh, so one of the first things I think I'd like to cover is uh, the gaming audience these days is very diverse. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to hear from each of your perspectives who you think your customer is, you know, maybe typical and average, um, or maybe how the customer might be different from what people might typically assume the gaming customer is. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to jump in and then I'll let these guys take it from there. But um, you know, when you think about the, the coming out of the casual mobile games, I think that really broadened out the definition of what is a gamer. So we think of a gamer stereotypically as that, that male who's in their late 20s or mid 20s, um, and now really everyone is a gamer. And I think that the mobile phone, the mobile platform really enabled that. Uh, you know, just some fun stats. When you think about Candy Crush, which is still in the, the top 10 today, I remember as the CFO of Candy Crush, I had to convince all investors that it wasn't a, a hit type of driven event, meaning that once you get into that top 10, you really can stay there. And so it's now been, gosh, how many years? You know, eight years or seven years where Candy Crush has been in that, that top 10 position, which is amazing. Um, but I think in the height, you know, it brought in about $2 billion worth of revenue. And when you think of $2 billion worth of revenue, 80% of that revenue came from women over the age of 35. And so that really changes the demographic of who is a gamer, right? Do you think of the moms out there saying, I'm a gamer? You know, no, they probably don't identify that way, but they truly are. And um, this type of game enabled um, the ability to interact with games without replacing other things. So they would interact with the games when they're waiting to pick up their children from school or when they're watching bad TV, they're also playing their game. So it was just additive to their day versus replacing something. So really broadened out and changed the definition of who a gamer was. Yeah, I think <clears throat> from my perspective, the other big thing that's happened the last few years on top of the rise of mobile gaming has been um, Kind of like the, the uh, it's like the pop culture phenomenon of gaming. Yeah. Um, seeing what Fortnite has done, it's like it's in the lexicon of of everyone across like all generations at this point, um, and seen across like celebrities and athletes and musicians. Um, and I think that that's just totally changed people's perspective on what it means to be a gamer. And so I think there are like 175 million gamers in the U.S. at this point. And so for us, like 
it's, it's more like there are small pockets maybe that we don't focus on, but otherwise we just consider everyone a gamer. And for 100 Thieves at this point, I think we have more fans over the age of 35 than under 18. So it's always like every day we're learning something new and surprising about like what, 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 what a modern gamer looks like. I mean, the holy grail for us actually is for the publisher to be our customer. Um, if we can use the, the brands that we build and cultivate and the fans that we have for those brands combined with um, the platform services that we're delivering to gamers in underserved markets, particularly under industrialized markets around the world, we think we can be a really efficient distribution resource for publishers. Um, and if you can kind of, if you can tap into that market, all of a sudden you're talking about a revenue stream that is not kind of taxed 50% by the talent itself, um, but is much higher margin, much more recurring, much more longer tail. I'm just gonna add one more yeah. quick thing, which I think is unusual, but I'm on the board of Hasbro as well. And so you think, okay, board games, right? Why am I on the board of Hasbro when digital gaming is my thing? Well, they invited me on the board because really when they create a product or a brand, they think about interacting with that consumer in all their paths of life or all their walks of life. So whether it's in the physical, whether it's in the digital, they don't roll out a new My Little Pony character <laughs> just to create a figurine, right? They create the story, they create the, the game around that My Little Pony brand. And so when you think about gamers, it really extends to all individuals right now and how they're interacting with entertainment. Um, and you know, Hasbro's really been embracing that. So I'd like to pick up that a little bit. Um, besides monetizing, you know, what is the most important thing that when you think about engagement with your players or customers that you want them to take away that makes them a fan or a lifetime, you know, attached to you for a lifetime in terms of your brand and engagement? So, so in our, one of our brands, one of our team brands is called MIBR, it stands for Made in Brazil. Um, and the conceit of that brand, what we're trying to achieve there is to build something that's a hybrid of a club team and a national team. So the idea that someone who's connected to gaming, either because they play the game, they watch the games, or they're familiar with other people who do, anywhere in Brazil, they can identify with this brand and it feels like their brand. This isn't a geolocated league, like say the Overwatch League or Major League Baseball, where you own a geographic territory exclusively. We've just made claim to that market through our brand. Um, and something that we've found through that uh, is that it really forms this very lasting connection with its audience. So MIBR, by the way, was, was a brand that was dormant until we kind of purchased it and rehabilitated and restarted it. But it, it came from Brazil. It came from the land center culture of Brazil in kind of the late 2008, 2009 era. And people were familiar with it. It was the first Brazilian gaming brand that kind of broke out, became internationally relevant, was winning international competition. And so we did this kind of video series about people reconnecting to the brand when we brought it back. Um, and what it meant to people to have that brand back in their lives. And I am not even joking. There were people who talked about how this brand had been there for them through difficult times. The, connecting to these players was um, something that got them through high school or got them through their parents' divorce or got them through their own divorce. Uh, and then of course we did the thing that all sports teams do where like they're talking to camera and then the MIBR players come out and surprise them and give them a free jersey, whatever. And these people <laughs> would, would break down and cry. And, um, and by the way, I don't speak Portuguese, um, but seeing that was something that crossed language barriers, it crossed age barriers, it crossed all sorts of other barriers because anyone can understand that intense connection to something um, and you can see it in someone else even if you don't have the connection to the same thing as that other person. Uh, and obviously, um, because of that, MIBR has grown very rapidly on all of the traditional KPIs that you might think of, you know, engagement, audience size, et cetera. Uh, we really just try to avoid like talking about our our community as customers or as fans. We think that that like old way of like the Yankees talking to their fans is is a bad way to do it, and it's kind of restricting of what the possibility of what esports and gaming is kind of all about. So we had our like first pop up retail event. Um, a lot of people there said that they felt like they were friends or part of the family as opposed to just fans, and we took that as like a huge compliment. So we think about how can we give them like transparency and access and a relationship that feels much more natural or much more modern than just the traditional kind of like team fan relationship. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think in the casual gaming market, um, it's slightly different than your guys' world, but we really focused on that deep engagement and the daily interaction. I mean, when you looked at it, we had 300 million users, about 2% would pay, which was plenty <laughs> <laughs> um, in regards to, but, but how do we keep those 2% engaged and, and enjoying the game? Um, there were several things we focused on. Um, number one, there is that social and competitive element. So a way for them to come into the game and, and interact with others and feel like there was a reason they needed to come to that game every day. One of the things that we really learned from the Asian market was they were having events and activities multiple times a day. So how do you have live events on a regular basis that people felt the need to come and engage with? And then there was also this very delicate balance of um, feeling a sense of accomplishment and feeling a sense of difficulty. So how do you craft the experience such that they would feel that adrenaline rush of, you know, of accomplishment that they did something and then that struggle of like trying to puzzle it out. And we would, you know, we really were, or are, I should say, a data analytics company in the sense that um, you really observed and analyzed every level and how people's experience was with that to experience that, that adrenaline rush of accomplishing something. Um, so lots of things happening in the gaming industry in terms of the industry expanding, audience being diverse. Um, I'm just kind of curious, what is, I think, one thing about the market today that you're very excited about that might not have been true, say, three or four years ago? Uh, I think three or four years ago, people looked at gaming as something that you would participate in or, and then maybe something that you would watch competitively. And there's this whole new aspect of watching gaming as entertainment, which is kind of like neither of those or somewhere in between. And that's kind of like a whole new world and a whole new landscape. And I think that there's infinite opportunity there. I think on YouTube, gaming is the number two category only behind music. So I think that's just proof that, um, yeah, people are looking to consume gaming in like whole new modalities or whole new ways. Um, and I think that the opportunity for kind of like progressive companies to take advantage of that is, yeah, um, unbounded right now. So I completely agree with that. Um, I also, something that we're excited about is just the distribution and democratization of gaming as mobile becomes more distributed in the developing world. Um, and we see what we call device convergence. You know, 10 years ago, you had a console, you had a PC, you had a laptop, and you had a phone. 10 years from now, you probably have one thing that's doing all of those things, or many of those things, so go long on peripherals. Um, but we, we also think that this is going to deliver and allow people in different geographies to discover some of the amazing content and IP that's existed at scale in the developed world for a long, long time. Um, one example of that, though not a perfect example, is there's a game called Counter-Strike that's 20 years old, um, that it has been a premier esport for 10 years. Um, it's known the world over, except until recently wasn't even available in China. Uh, and now it's having this entirely new life um, because it's become distributed in China and it's all of a sudden hit this new inflection point of growth. If you think about that as a model and you think about mobile coming on the back of it, we see that that's gonna happen again and again, just as all sorts of new developers are creating fantastic new IP, all of which will stimulate growth. Yeah, and I, I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with all those things. I just bring it down to like community and social are really new ways to interact with games. Um, I was just working with a game recently called Rec Room where people are like having pizza parties and they actually pay for pizza because they want to meet, you know, it's virtual pizza, it's not real pizza. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they're building their houses and then inviting people over to pizza parties in their houses. But this way to interact with your friends and, you know, in, a, in this virtual world is just really interesting. Um, another anecdote is recently there was an actual wedding in Rec Room where like people actually got married and I think that it's, it was, it was real. <laughs> But yeah, so this whole like building a community in a virtual world. Um, and so I have a number of kids myself. I'm curious. Five. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, like yeah. when he says a number, like, he has five. As, as of last count. Right. Yeah. I have three, and I that's a lot. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'm <laughs> constantly dealing with gaming in my household. I'm curious um, on your perspective on do you think of gaming and um, appealing to the whole family in terms of offering games as an entertainment value rather than one person in the family, but as a family unit? So I'll, I'll just take that from a Hasbro perspective, uh, the, the family card. Um, you know, what Hasbro has been very focused on, number one, I think there's been a resurgence in, in tabletop games. And the families getting together and playing together over a table, it's a, it's a wonderful way to be together as a unit. Um, but what they've really focused on adding in, and you're seeing this with a lot of tabletop games, is that digital interaction. I mean, we all recognize that kids these days are very comfortable and very used to interacting with you know, digital forms. And so how can you utilize an Alexa and then bring it into the board game? I've played some really fun interactive ones. The other day we were just doing um, this Play-Doh virtual world where you'd like create the Play-Doh figurines, put it, you know, take a picture of it, and then it would go into the Play-Doh world on the iPad and we'd make it move around and dance. Um, so there's a lot of, of new innovations in that and bringing the family together over, over both the digital and the physical formats. So, you know, um, when I was a kid, um, I grew up in the Northeast and from about early April until the end of school, I would wait at the door every day with my younger sister for my dad to get home because we went outside and played baseball in the yard. Um, we would play for an hour. I'm sure he was exhausted, but like we looked forward to that every day and we did it every day. Um, and I don't think that's because there's anything magic about baseball. I think that's because it was something that we did with my dad who was working a lot. Um, we were able to share that experience together and it felt scarce and special. Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Rick Fox or his story about how and why he founded Echo Fox, but Rick started playing League of Legends because it was something that his son did and he wanted to connect with his son. So I think the idea of parent-child connection isn't one that's restricted to digital or baseball or tabletop games or anything else. I, I think it's a function of where are the passions of the principles. Uh, and I think increasingly, the principles in this case, that is like new parents like, like John or me and our kids, people coming of age in a digital world, are going to find passion in things that are digital. Um, and so I look forward to sharing those passions with, with my kids just like my dad did with me and I don't, I don't see why it would be any different. Um, so I think there's been uh, you know, a lot of talk around coronavirus and what's going on these days. Some people, I think, are even saying it's good for the gaming industry because people are going to be indoors and playing more. I'm just curious, from your all perspective, do you see any major risks to the gaming industry given what's going on now and how people are reacting? Um, from what I've seen so far, I think the esports calendar is going to get devastated this year because of coronavirus issues. So I think League of Legends in China has been shut down and League of Legends uh, on the esports side and in Korea the same. So that's been a challenge. Um, but yeah, on the flip side, I heard that Tencent had one of the greatest months they'd ever had in the history of the company in January based on play patterns that they were seeing. So um, yeah, for all of us that are on the digital side of things, I think it's um, unfortunately a bad thing for the world, but maybe a good thing for, for some of our entertainment companies. So, by the way, we have an event this weekend in Los Angeles, and so uh, before this event, uh, this panel, immediately after, I'm going to be checking the news to try to figure out, you know, go, no, go on the event. So this is a very real and topical issue. Um, I think, to some degree, John is right with respect to the underlying fundamentals. I do think people will be playing more. I do think there's always, like, a hurdle to get over before you can really, like, find yourself connected to a game, and this is a great opportunity for people to find themselves crossing that hurdle. However, um, for esports teams and organizations, there's a tension where certain investors are interested in the fundamentals and others want to see top-line growth. And the first thing that's going to be pulled back if there's a coronavirus, coronavirus impact on the economy is speculative sponsorship budgets. And if speculative, speculative, that's a tongue twister. If speculative <laughs> sponsorship budgets get pulled back or decrease, um, all of a sudden certain investors are going to be wary of or um, less bullish on esports investment. Uh, and so the question is going to be how do investors really look at that? Do they focus on the fundamentals? Um, do they look at how gaming is performing relative to the rest of the market? Or do they just look at top line? Is it growing? Is it not? 
Was it consistent with the forecast in the last round of financing? Um, and each investor, I think, is going to make their own determination to the extent that, as a group, investors view that very negatively. That could be another challenge for gaming. Yeah, in the casual gaming world, we always have the phrase, uh, snow days. We love snow days. <laughs> Um, our business analytics would like shoot up. It was always big peaks whenever it snowed. Um, so, you know, I view this as similar for that sector, very different than esports, which is, you know, bringing people together. But when you are at home unexpectedly with not as much on your calendar, um, the activity and the game levels definitely increases. And those are usually positive monetary days. <laughs> <laughs> positive for the gaming space. Yep. I mean, I know what would happen if we let all of our employees work from home. And <laughs> what would happen? It's not productivity. Right. They play Gaming. games. <laughs> um, so I have a few more minutes. Kind of just wanted to ask, what's probably the one thing you're most excited for for your company or in the gaming industry in, say, the next 12 months? Um, hmm. I was completing our next fundraising round. Is that is that it? No. Um, look, I, th I think um, we're actually moving. Be good into, with this audience. No, no, we're we're moving into new office space. Um, I encourage everyone to look at the video that John's company put out about their new office space. But um, we've been in this kind of very fragmented working environment where there's a bunch of little buildings, um, and culture has ad adapted to that by like really migrating to Slack, um, which I absolutely hate. I'm kind of an old school guy, as John Wooden said, the trouble with new books is they keep you from reading the old ones. And so I'm really excited for all of us to be in one space together where there are, like, there's no excuse for um, trading off the opportunity to sit down at a table or talk to someone face to face. I think it's gonna really bring us all together. Um, in terms of the industry, um, I think what, what John was saying about kind of the convergence of gaming, pop culture, music, I think that's happening in traditional sports too. Like Kevin Durant is every bit as relevant today as he was last year, but he's not playing basketball. He's interacting directly. He's taking that kind of community orientation versus a fan orientation and bringing it to life in traditional sports and, and other traditional sports athletes have done the same. Um, and so I think 12 months from now, that will have completely tipped. Um, and, and organizations like John's are certainly on the leading edge of that. Uh, and I think the more that there's this kind of mainstream adoption, the more we can get over this e what's e-gaming, you know, is gaming a bad thing? Um, we can kind of put all those issues to the side and really focus on engagement and growth. Uh, for me, I'm just really excited to see what new games come out. I think we are still like the progression year to year, generation to generation. When I think about what the what the we did for popularity of gaming across family and gaming going to the mainstream. Same with mobile gaming, same with Fortnite. I get really excited when I think about what the next generation could be, which is not hundreds of millions of gamers playing a game, but billions of gamers playing a game um, and the possibilities that come from that. So I'm really excited that there are small developers and major publishers all thinking about what that could be because I still think Everyone knows how big Fortnite was or League of Legends was. I still think that we're at, I don't know, 40 or 50 percent capacity of what actually is is possible. Um, so very, very bullish on on what the major game publishers are going to put out. I say I'm bullish on that too, and I think I'm bullish on or very excited about people who are not traditionally in the game space and what they're thinking about the game space. So. I mean, to me, what's interesting is the blurring of lines between television and gaming and how those sort of intersect when you're interacting with something that's either a stream or content. Um, and I think the definition of gaming is, you know, getting bigger and broader in some sense. Yeah, and I'll just add, I think this whole concept of community within the game, building your own game within a game, yeah. um, and interacting, feeling like you're part of the creation of the game. I'm seeing this in more and more games that are coming to fruition. Um, but the ability to really like immerse yourself in a world and then be part of the creation of that world, um, you're seeing that in all different ways, and it's it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. A little bit scary as a parent, so we monitor that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I'm constantly dealing with yeah. that. You know, parental controls, control of time. But yeah, there's there's a lot of good in that too. So like, it's understanding like it's not 
you know, a, a negative thing and a lot, like what I see, my, my son is in college now, he really interacts with his friends via the gaming from all over the world and country. We lived in London for a while. He still interacts with his London friends through that medium. So there's a lot of positives, but, but clearly as a parent, I want to know what's going on in there. Um, so there's that balance. Well, thank you. I think we're nearing the end of our time and there'll be another session coming up. Uh, so thank you all for joining me today to talk about trends in gaming. Um, and if you all have questions, I'll be hanging around for a few minutes afterwards. Thank you.